Um, welcome everybody to the Diamond Doors. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as usual, I'm MC Owens. Uh, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective all the time. And uh, tonight is a, a special night, of course, uh, because we're going to talk about the Dharma. And the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors um, so the theme tonight is something called uh, Viparyasa, something you might not have heard before, that, that word before, that particular idea, Viparyasa, means inversion, upside down, <laughs> twisted, actually. And there is actually a teaching that we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about it all night in depth. And it's this teaching that's called the four inversions, the four viprayasa. Um, the reason why this is the theme tonight is, as you know, on Sunday nights, we read sutras. We've been reading the sutra for a while now. And in the sutra that we're reading, which is, of course, a Mahayana Buddhist sutra from, you know, the big old Maharatna Kutta sutra collection. But in tonight's reading, if we, if we even get there, in tonight's reading, this teaching comes up. And it's particularly about how the, how the Bodhisattva, that's what the sutra we're reading is about, about the Bodhisattva path. And this is interesting because it it's talks about how the bodhisattva deals with these four inversions. Actually, it's more about what the bodhisattva does to avoid them or to understand them. But if you don't know what they are, then it, it really makes the sutra not as, as impactful in that way. So this is such a, actually a really important teaching I actually mention the ideas. I mention this idea a lot in the Dharma doors, but I probably have never actually mentioned this word or these four ideas in this way. So we're going to go through it. But, um, but actually, there's going to be a lot going on tonight, dharmically speaking, because I'll tell you why. So this is an old teaching, this four inversions. And so I'm going to read to you from whence this teaching comes, like the, the original source for this teaching. And that will acquaint us with the four inversions and give us a sense of what it's all about. And then we're going to come back to our Mahayana Sutra. So it'll be interesting to look at this same idea from its original source and from this sort of uh, more developed or later, you know, however you want to think about Mahayana Buddhism, we'll look at it from a Mahayana perspective. So where I'm reading from tonight to start us off is from one of the Nikayas, as they're called. This is the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha. So what's cool about this collection, as you can see, this is a really substantial collection of sutras. This, of course, is from the Pali tradition. This is, these are translations from that Pali language. And if you don't know about the Anguttara Nikaya, it's divided into teachings that the Buddha gave in lists of twos, in lists of threes, in lists of fours, in lists of fives, sixes, seven. It's how it's divided is. What, what kind of list are we dealing with here? And I've already mentioned that tonight we're dealing, the, dealing with the four inversions. And so it's in the section on the fours. It's the 49th sutta of that section of teachings in fours, and it happens to be the ninth part of the 49th section of the section in fours. And it's called, Vipra, or actually in Pali, it would be Vipalasa. 
So Pali has that kind of lisp, more of a lisp than a traditional Sanskrit. But that's just the name of it, the Vipalasa Sutta. And yeah, I'm going to read this basically probably in three parts. The first part will just be the, the Buddha laying out the terms. I want to discuss the terms and then I'll finish the sutra. So it's a pretty simple sutra. Um, he says to the practitioners, there are these four vi prayasa, these four inversions. Inversions of, and these are not the four, by the way, but these are the four inversions of perception, mind, and view. What for? The inversion of perception, mind, and view, which takes the impermanent to be permanent. The inversion of perception, mind, and view, which takes suffering to be pleasurable. The inversion of perception, mind, and view that takes what has no self to be a self. And number four, the inversion of perception, mind, and view, which takes that which is unattractive or unlovely or impure to be attractive, lovely, or pure. These are the four inversions of perception, mind, and view. There's more to the sutra, of course, but let's talk about all of that for a moment. So it's, all, it's already a pretty complicated teaching. <laughs> and it's actually why I wanted to do it tonight, because you know, it, it'll be fun to just sort of dismantle all of this. So <laughs> right away, this isn't as simple as it seems. We're dealing with these four inversions, mistaking you know, the suffering to be pleasurable, mistaking this to be that. So we'll deal with the four inversions. But what, what I first want to deal with is that these are inversions of perception, samya, inversions of mind or chitta, and inversions of a view or dristi. So those are the three inversions or or the yeah like those are the three things that get inverted that get twisted or flipped upside down and they each get twisted or flipped upside down in regard to these four things right the idea of dukkha what is suffering the idea of well the self of course the idea of impermanence impermanence and then this one about unattractive and attractive, which I, I want to deal with that one very carefully. It's really interesting. But again, first, let's deal with what's getting inverted. and What are they even talking about? So the first thing, and these are, by the way, kind of uh, progressive, meaning the first of these is this idea of perception, samya. And of course, you know, I know you know, that samya or perception is one of the five aggregates, one of the five constituent elements of a sentient creature in that sense, right? The five aggregates being this body of form, senses from the sensory organs, perception, samya, which is what we're talking about. And then, of course, conditioning and then vijnana or consciousness, which is not mind. That's not chitta. The constituent elements here, in terms of this body of form, which is different than that body of form and that body of form and all of those bodies of forms I see, this is this body of form. And because it's this body of form with these sensory organs and not those sensory organs, 
this is this with these sensations, these particular sensations of being on this end, this end of the class tonight, this end. So that's this, so the body of form, the sensations, and then the perception that's going on over here. So this is the samnya. It's a constituent element of that, meaning what you might think is you in that way, constituent element of me. And so let's talk about samnya really quickly. Samnya is this idea of perception. And the thing about perception is, it's really helpful to know that perception in Buddhism, samnya, what samnya is in the business of perceiving, if we're going to call this samnya perception, what samnya perceives is characteristics. Lakshana, they're called. That's what samnya is dealing with, characteristics. So let me show you, I have an example I want to work with tonight, and I'm going to the best of my ability, try to, I'm going to try to stick to kind of one working example tonight to keep all of this wrapped around. Most of you have probably seen this one before, but in terms of perception, it's really helpful to know or consider that it's like this. Imagine that you saw something and it looked like that. The idea is, is that there's sort of two general ways to perceive this. You could kind of go the bunny rabbit route, or you can go the quack, quack, quack duck route, right? And the idea is, is that depending on what you're perceiving here, it would change what the characteristics are. And you could think of it just in terms of like, is it furry or is it feathery? Well, that characteristic of being furry or being feathery, it's really going to deter, it's really going to depend on what you think you are seeing in that way. But I would encourage you to be thinking about how you might actually be thinking of those characteristics as being those characteristics because you think you're seeing what you're seeing. <laughs> and that's a kind of little recursive feedback loop of thought where we think we thought what we saw because we thought what we saw was what we saw <laughs> or something like that, right? But my point is, is this is really what the, the point is of this example. Let's imagine that there's two different people here, and one person sees a rabbit. Like that's, that's what they perceive. And another person sees a duck. That divergence in perception is what would make that that person and that that person. It's another constituent element of, of their sensoriness is that they're that body of form and not that body of form. They're having those sensations and not those sensations. And they're perceiving what they're perceiving. Meanwhile, this per person is perceiving something else. So that's perception, which is it is truly about what you are perceiving. Now, though, I want to add to this a an, an emotional tone or emotional texture to this. So what I want, let's imagine, and I always kind of like to use this same scenario. Let's imagine that someone as a child was taken to a petting zoo where they were given a little bunny rabbit. And there's something about that day where it was the best day of their life. Like it just was the, you know, the weather was perfect and everything went great. And it's all kind of bound up in this memory 
of a bunny rabbit. Meanwhile, there's somebody else who, as a child, went to a petting zoo, and there was this really mean duck. And the really mean duck came up and actually bit them as a child, causing all of these tears and all of that. Not to mention that it was like the worst day ever, bad weather. It was just terrible. And so now when person A sees the bunny rabbit, not only are they seeing something different than the other person, their emotional response is entirely different. Meaning that the, the person who thinks it's a bunny rabbit is also getting these like warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feelings because they've associated bunny rabbits with like the best day of their life. And it was so cute and fuzzy and all of, you know, all of that, that they're having a positive reaction in that sense. The duck viewer though, is recalling all of these negative memories and is associating the duck with that and is kind of basically repelled <laughs> by the duck is, is like, it maybe even has a slight phobia about this duck where they're like, oh. So now you have these two totally different perceptions, but also reactions in that way. So that, those two states of mind, a, a nostalgia filled state of mind, a joyful, pleasant state of mind, that's a chitta. Chitta is the overall mind state. Now, it, it isn't just about the warm, fuzzy feeling. The, a chitta or a mind state is the, it, well, you're in one right now. It's the mind state that hopefully is enjoying this and thinks it's you sitting wherever you're sitting doing, that's all part of the mind state. And maybe you're a little hungry too. And maybe you're a little this too. And may, but whatever it is, right now is the totality of that mind state. And as the Buddha describes, a lot of the reason to pay attention to mind states is about anger-filled mind states, joy-filled mind states, all these different kinds of mind states that we could be in. And what we're interested in terms of vipassana, in terms of insight, is understanding from whence is this mind state arising. That's what the one aspect of Vipassana would be, okay, I'm in this mind state and I'm having this warm, fuzzy feeling, or I'm in this mind state and I'm a little nervous and kind of like, don't, you know, don't feel so good. Those are the two mind states and both of these people could reflect on what is giving rise to these states of mind. They could understand, oh, it's coming from these memories I have of these things, <laughs> meaning the rabbit or the duck, and kind of walk through the process I just talked about. I'm not here to really talk about Vipassana just yet, but I wanna clarify that the mind state arises from perception that what those two people perceived determined the state of mind that they were in. That's the kind of the most important kind of point about that trajectory. Now, the third, so, I mean, again, I'm just defining, I'm just defining perception, defining mind. And then I want to define the third of these, which is about a view, a drishti. So I often mention this idea of a drishti, a view when, when I teach or in Dharma doors here. And it's such an important idea to understand, in particular, like to really understand the subtlety of Buddhism, the subtlety of Buddha Dharma. You really got to understand a drishti because a drishti is this idea of a view, but it's more like the idea of a, a religious view a political view, what we would call a world view. And so the important thing to keep in mind about a view is that basically, except for Buddhas, we all have one. 
And what I mean is, is that a view is this kind of overall understanding that you have about what's going on here and kind of what's important and what's not important, so to speak. Views, a view has a lot to do with where you think the world came from and where you think the world is going. And that includes where you came from and where you're going. So it's kind of a cosmological understanding. And if all of a sudden, if you're saying, whoa, Michael, I don't have a cosmological view, you know, so I may not have one of these drishtis you're talking about. No, no, no. What I'm talking about is, is that a drishti is this idea of where the world came from. And whether you're a, Christ, a Christian and think God created the world, or you think a Big Bang, and it was like a singularity that exploded because it got so dense, or I don't know. But the idea is, is that whether you think it was that, or whether you think it was that, or if you think, I don't know, or you think it's unknowable, whatever you're convinced of, that's your view. That's the idea. And, the, and that's where it's so tricky because it's not about having this view or that view. It's about having a view at all. So that's a drishti, a view. And actually, because I, I feel like we'll, we'll have a good Dharma talk tonight, let's just hold off on you know, deeper ideas about view right now. But it's just about that idea of having a, a, a perspective or a view on something. And I'm going to give more examples of this as it goes along. So, so those are the three things that can get inverted. Perception can get inverted. The mind state, chitta, can get inverted. And then a view could get inverted. Everybody doing okay with the definition of those three terms? Cool. So now we get to the, the inversions proper, like the actual four inversions, and let's talk about them. So the first one is always about, and I, was, I, was, I know that before I gave you a different order, but the first of these is always about mistaking that which is impermanent to be permanent. That's the first inversion. And it's an inversion of perception. It's an inversion of a chitta. And it's an inversion of a view. So let's sort of walk through that one a little bit. So this is a classic one. This is a kind of a classic Buddhist idea in terms of forgetting. And forgetting that that which is impermanent or so you think it's permanent, you think things are going to last. And the thing about it is, is that, you know, in getting ready, even for this Dharma talk tonight, I've noticed how much of this I do, like how much of this is built into the way I perceive, built into the way I think, and built into my view in a way. So let me walk you again through kind of what I mean by that. The idea of mistaking the that which is impermanent for being permanent the first way that you can think of that of course is this idea of everything being kind of in constant flux constant change the nature of reality is that is it is in constant flux and constant change at a kind of elemental level and I'm thinking Western physics here, not Eastern uh, Indian uh, physics elemental, but even in Western physics, we have this, this, the law of the conservation of energy, it's called. And it's this idea that energy sort of just floats around, changes states, it's neither, neither created nor destroyed in that way, but that the nature of this system, to use that physical language, is one of constant change. And in many ways, you know, again, this is sort of common knowledge. But 
do we actually behave and act and think according to that knowledge? We often seem very surprised or at the very least very let down <laughs> that things went ahead and changed on us <laughs> when we knew that that was their very nature to do that. But again, sometimes we forget that and then we get a little disappointed and upset when things change. And that would be the inversion or that would be the inversion of mistaking everything that's impermanent, but thinking now oh, maybe this time it's permanent in a certain way. Now, because this is an, an, an advanced Dharma class, <laughs> I want to mention something about, and I, gotta, I have to do it now because I want to keep doing it as we move along, but it's about a very subtle distinction between what would be called Hinayana and Mahayana uh, philosophy or thinking or whatever. And what I mean is, is it has to do with this idea of impermanence. The Buddha said, it, it, well, the Buddha said actually a lot of things about impermanence. So I'm not going to misquote those just yet. But what I want to say is, is this teaching of things being impermanent from a Hinayana point of view. So from an early, early um, Ver, like from the Buddhist tradition that this sutra comes from, impermanence was about decay. Like that basically in a way, I, I guess to use my physics analogy, early Buddhism is about entropy. <laughs> it's about everything moving towards that, that entropy. And so whether it is me quote unquote, me in that way, or my cup, or my cell phone, or whatever, the Hinayana view is that everything is sort of so fragile, and it's falling apart. And some things fall apart quick, and some things fall apart slow, but things are sort of fragile like that, in the decaying entropic sense. That's their impermanence. And so from a Hinayana point of view, it's kind of like we're, we're building these sand castles of our lives and the ocean keeps coming in and, and making the sand castles go away. But we've worked, we've worked so hard on our sand castle though. <laughs> like, ah, but you, dude, you're making a sand castle at the beach. It's the nature of that sand castle. You know, Jimmy, did you know the Jimi Hendrix song? It's, it's, you know, the idea is castles made of sand. They, they float into the sea. So my point is, is that from a Hinayana point of view, things are futilely falling apart and you're falling apart and everything's falling apart. Okay. And if we get inverted about that, meaning, first of all, in terms of our perception, the perception being this is going to last. No, it's not going to last. <laughs> but if you perceive it that way, if you perceive something as being as a stable entity forever, always, that's an inversion of perception. It's, it's actually not in line with, quote unquote, the nature of things in that sense. Let me, let me finish kind of going through this, a Hinayana inversion of chitta. I, I did it a moment ago, and I'm going to keep doing it. If Samya is about perception, let's just call chitta thinking. Just for now, just for tonight, let's meet. And what I mean is, is that if I perceive something as being permanent, I will probably most likely think of it as, it, as, or sorry, if I see it as, or perceive it as permanent, I will think of it as permanent. 
you follow me on that per, that per, progression that we it, again it's kind of like if i perceive it as a rabbit then i'm going to be thinking of it as a rabbit if i perceive it as permanent be thinking of it as permanent and then if i'm seeing or sorry perceiving things as permanent and therefore thinking of things as permanent then the view that i develop about what's going on here will be a view that is based upon this idea that things are permanent <laughs> and remember a view is this kind of staunch background running opinion about why i should be doing anything why you should be doing anything why anybody should be doing anything in a way so everybody following me on the hinayana inversion of the three samya those three right I want to now mention impermanence from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective. So things get a little more subtle when we're in Bodhisattva land. And here's how perception of something, like perceiving it as permanent, but it's actually impermanent. From the Mahayana point of view, it's actually more about somebody who thought they saw a rabbit. And then something occurs to them or somebody mentions something and they go, oh, it's a duck. Now, I'm not talking about the optical illusion that I have in my hand. I'm talking about going from the belief thinking perception that it is a rabbit. And then all of a sudden, oh, I had it wrong. It's a duck. What happened to the rabbit? Where's the rabbit? Oh, it's almost as if it was impermanent. It was almost as if that perception of a rabbit was revealed to be totally impermanent. <laughs> Boom, it's gone. And what I want you to notice about the Mahayana view of impermanence is that things are gone instantly because they never were, not slowly over time. It doesn't matter which actually you're interested in because they're both in a way true in that sense, that things from a certain perceptive level are decaying. And from an even deeper perceptive level, they aren't even existent to then decay. But I just want you to notice it's a subtle difference, but it's kind of the same idea. Because you would be now to go back to my initial two people, one of the the person who's all excited about this rabbit and this person who's all anxious about this duck, they have inverted perception. They're locked into a perception of it being this or that when it's not. There's other options, but it's the being locked into that perception that makes it inverted in that way. So they're both kind of inverted in their perception. And then because they're both sitting there thinking, oh, that's a rabbit or that's a duck. And then having these chitta mind states develop where you're actually somebody's anxious or somebody's actually excited. Those are the chitta, inverted chitta mind states that have been developed out of these inverted perceptions. And now let's start getting to these inverted views. Now, the idea of this view of these things as being permanent. This, well, anyways, the view, I have more to say, but I kind of want to build up to this idea, but it's about this idea of them being existent things and therefore being something really to get excited or worked up about. And then just to, just to basically give you an idea of where the view is going. Then what also happens out of that inversion 
is a kind of a sense of, well, you could call it, I would call it, I guess, speciization. And what I mean is, is that now, if you're at the level where you're thinking that that is a rabbit or a duck, either one of them, by the way, you're kind of developing this worldview that's about zoology, that's about species of animals, and wrapped up in the view of speciization is you, the viewer, as a member of the zoological family that isn't a rabbit or a duck, but understands what a rabbit or a duck is from the vantage point of being a human. My point is, is that when we see something and call it an, an animal, there's a lot of ideology actually going into that. And I use that term ideology like carefully and I mean to use it. It's an ideology to even think of things, yes, in terms of species, but then what I'm thinking more about is the idea that the human species is somehow better or above these other species. That's an even deeper level of having a zoological view. And I'm gonna get to a sensitive issue in a second, but basically it's about the idea that like animals need our protection. That mentality that goes back to our petting zoo and all of that is a kind of interesting mentality that again, elevates the human to an interesting level. I'm not saying it's right or wrong or good or bad. It's just about it being part of the view in that way. Okay, everybody doing okay with the first inversion about impermanence, impermanence, what that's all about and how then perception, mind or views get, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I think I have a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, it seems like the, the, the Mahayana version of impermanence, as you were describing it tonight, is, um, it's much more instantaneous. It doesn't require time the way the, the Hinayana one does. Is that, is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? And yep. it, 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 which seems like it has ramifications for, for, you know, our worldview and, 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 and also for practicality of sort of like, well, oh, you know, this chocolate bar is not a good example, but I don't know, this Dharma center won't last forever, but it's here now and it's pretty good. So I'm, I'm cool, you know, mm. versus. Uh, well, yeah, on that, so, on that note, I wanted to say something about my sandcastle analogy. Building sandcastles is fun. And the idea is, is that if you go into it with the right view, if you go into it with the right mentality, which is that these sandcastles are not made to last, let's have fun. Then you get to have fun and not get disappointed when the ocean comes in and wipes it out. That's the idea. So no, my, I hope that kind of addresses your last kind of point in that point way, which is that this is about being, it's actually about not being foolish. Wisdom is often about not being foolish. And again, foolishness is about knowing things are impermanent, but wishing or hoping otherwise. Um, one other thing, just that the, these four inversions, three yep. of them are about the three characteristics, right? And the fourth one is sort of tangential. To Indeed. And it, something. The, it's something. Are you going to talk about that? Yeah. Okay. And I'm glad you noticed that these have similarities to well, it has similarities to a lot of other teachings but in particular the three marks in that way yeah um speaking of which because i want to get through all four we definitely got to get through all four so let's move ahead so in our sutra and i'll stick to the i'll stick to the order from the original one 
So after it was about permanence, impermanence, it was that tricky one. Um, oh no, not the tricky one. A tricky one, but not the, that one that Noam just mentioned. So the second one is the classic one in Buddhism, which is mistaking dukkha for sukkha, mistaking suffering for pleasure or for bliss, right? So that's, of course, one of the main, you know, teachings of the Buddha, of course, is this, these noble truths, uh, the, these noble truths about dukkha, about suffering. And this teaching about the inversion of that, of course, is about mistaking suffering for a good time. <laughs> That's like, bait. that is the bottom line idea of it. And, you know, there's a lot of different examples that we could give of mistaking suffering for pleasure. And again, this sukkha is bliss. So that's the inversion, the classic Buddhist one. And in terms of these three, the in terms of perceiving, perceiving, of course, is we're back to that idea of looking at the world and the idea of a good time, well, mistaking sukkha for dukkha, although this is kind of not exactly the example I'd want to use, but I want to stick to my example, because what I mean is it's about this sort of perceiving something as um, capable of producing pleasure. That's the inversion of perception. Whatever it is, whether it's with your eyes, your ears, you know, the ice cream man, the, your nose, your tongue, your body, it's the idea that, oh, that, that could give me pleasure. That idea of sukkha, of, of, of bliss, joy, the idea that, it, it, that you'll get it, that you will get sukkha from that or, no, or that, that's the inversion of perception, perceiving something as a pleasure-inducing object or a pleasure-inducing idea. And the in the inversion of that, as I often mention in most of my Dharma talks, and this is actually an important distinction to make with Hinayana Mahayana, this idea of, oh, that'll give me sukkha. That's the inversion. The inversion is thinking that something other than you will give you pleasure. And it's not actually how pleasure works. We all give ourselves pleasure. And I don't mean that in any double entendre way. I mean that it's the only way it happens actually is that we make ourselves happy. Now, many of us are convinced that we need this, this or that in order to do that. <laughs> but that's the inversion. That's the upside down thinking which is this idea that it has to be done that way. And then what happens, of course, with this inversion is that when we're perceiving objects as pleasure-inducing objects, then our thinking becomes inverted about what pleasure is. Our, the very mind state of going like, you know what? I'm not happy. I know what will make me happy, and it's something <laughs> other than peacefully tranquil be, tranquilly being. I need this to do it. I, so your the thinking is upside down because it thinks a certain way. It's thinking that pleasure comes from external objects, 
And then that, of course, becomes an inversion of view. And that view is the oldest view probably in existence, which is this idea that the view is about maximizing pleasure. And then the way to do that is acquisition, acquisition, acquisition of stuff, acquisition of experiences, acquisition of knowledge, but it has to be acquired. It definitely needs to be acquired. So that's the view. And I hope you notice how that view is a pretty substantial one, meaning that it's a kind of a, a pretty popular view in the world and that that view comes from a certain way of thinking and that way of thinking comes from a certain way of perceiving, right? And so, right, that's, that's that idea. Everybody doing okay with the dukkha sukha inversions? Because of time, I'm not going to do a Hinayana Mahayana one on this one. Um, if there is time, I'll, I'll mention something interesting at the end, but I want to, it's much more important to get through the four inversions. So everybody feeling okay though about those first two. The third one in the original sutta is the one of mistaking. And this is always difficult to say in English. <laughs> It's about mistaking anatman, or it's mistaking anatman for atma, mistaking no self for self. <laughs> so that's again one of you know the big ones, one of those big ideas. It is one of the three characteristics that Noam mentioned. I did a whole night, a whole Sunday night, a few weeks ago on this teaching of no self. So a whole hour and a half just on this idea. So I'm not going to repeat all of that, but I will repeat the probably the most important part of that talk. So about this no self that thinks it's a self, <laughs> the idea of what's going on there, it's an inversion, of course, of perception like meaning that when we look in the mirror, when we look down at our own feet, when we look at our hands, there's an a inversion of perception about self. There's obviously an inversion in chitta in terms of the way that we think regarding self. And that of course is going to then culminate in views from the place of self. So if we're going to understand how we perceive invertedly, think invertedly, and view in that sense invertedly, the one thing I want to mention about this no self, I'll try to do the Hinayana one, Mahayana one on this one because it actually is really important. But in both traditions, actually, it, it's all about this. There's a tendency of mind. There's a tendency of mind to appropriate. And what appropriate means is my water bottle. So you could call it, it's the perception of ownership, claiming, uh, dibs. <laughs> I got dibs, right? Um, but it's, that's, a fancy philosophical term for that is appropriation. So mind has a tendency to appropriate and say, ooh, my water bottle, right? You probably do something like that, where you appropriate things in that you think they're yours and not other people's, right? Okay. So there's a tendency of mind to appropriate objects, my water bottle, my cell phone, my this, this, and that. Mind, mind's tendency to appropriate also does this weird thing where it says, my hand, my body. And right there, we, it, it, the, the, the 
the problem begins to reveal itself. When we say my body, where is this me who is who has a body? So who is appropriating the water bottle and this and the body? Well, mind also has a tendency then to appropriate thinking and say my thoughts, what I just said, my words. And what's going on here is actually, it's a very subtle but powerful tendency of the mind to appropriate, to appropriate everything. And now we get into the more complex part of this. When the inversion is about mistaking no self, or sorry, mistaking yeah, no self for having a self, it's about the man in the mirror, so to speak, but it's also about how we view others. Because I say, oh, that's, that's your body. So I'm doing it when I do it that way too. So you could also then say that this appropriating mind, it's, it's appropriating and what do you call that? When you like ascribe ownership to somebody else and say, oh, that's your, that's, that's a funny thing you said. So this tendency of the mind, it does it this way and it does it that way. And so everything kind of needs to belong to somebody in that way, in that sense. So what I'm getting at is, is that when it taught, when the Buddha, when Buddhism talks about this inversion, about thinking there's a self when there's no self, it's about mind's tendency to appropriate. And in a way, not in a way, but the idea is that there is then this same mind can function without that tendency. But it would be really not right to say then that that's you thinking the right way. Right? because <laughs> if you're if you're thinking that's the wrong way right so that's the inversion of self i just want to point out how how subtle it is <laughs> and again the inversion of self or mistaking no self for self happens at the level of perception again whenever i look in the mirror whenever i look at my little zoom my little zoom window where I see myself, myself, when I look down, that's the perception inversion regarding self. Again, the, the chitta or the mind state is that chitta is this, again, this mind state that you're in. I'm in a mind state right now. And my mind state is still working within that framework of the appropriating mind. That's still very about what Michael said in that sense. So my chitta is operating in that inverted way of thinking it is self. <laughs> and then, of course, the establishment of views based upon self. That, from my knowledge, is called everything but Buddhism. There is a great sutra, one of the first. In fact, I think it is the first. I think it's the first sutra in, in the Diga Nikaya. So the very, very first sutta, the Brahmajala Sutra, Brahma's net. Let's see. This is the very first Diga Nikaya, and it's called the Brahmajala Sutta what the dharma is not <laughs> what the teachings are not and if you read that sutra it's about the 62 erroneous views 
the Buddha lays out all these different worldviews, drishtis, they're called, that were popular at the time. Everything from the idea that you go to heaven after you die, the idea that your body breaks up and goes to flowers when you die, the idea that you're just trapped in samsara forever. He goes through all these different views. And he says, oh yeah, all of them presume there's a self. And then after that, it's about where you go after you die, what happens to you after you die, what should you do about your karma to get your better. And it's a whole worldview that comes out of the delusion around the nature or this idea of self. So that's, those are those three. The thing that I was going to say about the Hinayana Mahayana difference there. Mm, there's not a lot. It, it, it's sort of the only subtle difference is that in the Hinayana, there's a way in which basically the Arahat has no self. <laughs> Apparently. And what I mean about that is, is that in this subtle, subtle teaching that I just shared with you regarding no self, it eventually in the Mahayana tradition, they come to this great realization of the emptiness of all phenomena, which is this even grander idea of no self. Because the teaching of no self in the Hinayana was primarily about humans, but it kind of included other species, including gods and ghosts as well. But that self wasn't real. It's an illusion, a fiction, again, a, a you know, fabrication of the appropriating mind. But the elements like earth, water, fire, and air, and like all the building blocks and all the Dharma, all of that is kind of real in Hinayana. It's only the no self, it's only the self that is kind of this fiction. In the Mahayana, they realize that whatever it is, whatever it is, it's kind of like a rabbit or I mean a duck or what I mean is, is that it's everything is a false perception in that sense. So the no self teaching just kind of runs basically deeper in the Mahayana that it applies to everything. Whereas in the Hinayana, it just applies to people who would think they would otherwise have a self. Put it that way. Okay. Let's get to the fourth inversion. The first three are kind of par for the course of Buddhism. You probably heard most of those ideas before. So the fourth one, let me grab the sutra. So this is the one about mistaking what they translate as mistaking what is unattractive for a, being attractive, all right? So the terms are um, mistaking asubha, and that literally means unlovely, unlovely. <laughs> mistaking that which is unlovely for being lovely. And this is one of those ones, it's a complicated one. And rather actually then, it'll be one of those situations that where rather than telling you exactly what that word means, it's much more helpful to appreciate uh, the range of possible meanings. So attractive, unattractive, lovely, not lovely. There is definitely an, an aesthetic, aesthetic vibe to this. So you could throw in beautiful and ugly, mistaking the, that which is ugly for being beautiful, that is like attractive, unattractive. 
But there's also this other ideas of, say, good and bad, and a very strong candidate for a translation is pure and impure. But you would really need to know your Buddhism to appreciate what they mean by pure and impure, because those are delicate terms. But that's kind of the range of meanings of this last inversion, all right? And it's tricky because this, you know, this has a lot to do with, I would say, uh, Shila morality. It has a lot to do with morality. And it has a lot to do with morality in the sense of mistaking that which is immoral for being moral in that sense. And that is where you get to the idea of purity and impurity, because things that are like basically in Buddhism, you should keep in mind that telling a lie, being deceitful is impure. <laughs> and being truthful is pure. So that's our kind of uh, baseline definition of pure and impure there. It's a kind of a moral thing. And, you know, there's a lot of things you could think about as, you know, as someone who thinks a lot about ahimsa, for example, nonviolence. I have noticed in myself, and this is something, you know, I always try to really just talk from personal experience in that way, but it's something that I've noticed in myself that as my practice has gone along, my tolerance for visual violence as, as an art form, so I'm talking about violent movies, my tolerance for violent movies has decreased a lot. Um, and it's decreased as a kind of realization of an inverted view, of mistaking what should be not <laughs> appreciated. Which, and what I mean appreciated is, is what should be disturbed, disturbing. When it reaches a level of aesthetic beauty, right? And this is somebody who really liked my, you know, John Woo, shoot them up crazy is, you know, so I've come a long way in this. So I just want you to kind of be thinking about what that is to kind of glorify in that sense and aestheticize violence to that degree. Just pointing at one example of how the perception, so starting with perception of perceiving uh, you know, Quentin Tarantino, wow, and perceiving of somebody getting de de decapitated as, oh, that's so beautiful. If that's the perception that that's beautiful, then that leads, of course, to a kind of an er inverted kind of thinking about what is wholesome and unwholesome, beautiful and unbeautiful in that way. And then, of course, you then develop a worldview based upon that kind of perception in mind in that sense. So that is the fourth inversion. And again, it's encountered in those three realms. All right, everybody feeling okay? That was a lot of Dharma, by the way, heap of Dharma. All right, then great. So here's an interesting thing I wanna tell you. I've been doing this Hinayana Mahayana thing for a while. So <laughs> if, let's see, where can I do it? Well, basically I'll tell you this. There is a very kind of interesting distinction regarding these four inversions in the Hinayana and the Mahayana. And the distinction that's made is, is this. They say that the early form of Buddhism, the, the so-called Hinayana, it denies, categorically denies permanence, bliss, self, and 
purity in that sense, it denies the four, those four, in samsara and nirvana. And what that means is, is that, is, for example, when it says, it's actually really interesting. And I've read the sutras that, that talk about this teaching. I've read all the different sutras that mention it. And the Buddha is very clear about the way he uses language. And what I mean is, is that all the translations I can find and all the original texts that I can read, it's about the inversions are about mistaking that which is impermanent for being permanent. Now, did the Buddha say nothing's permanent? Or did he say, don't mistake that which is impermanent for being permanent? A better example is the one about bliss. The Buddha said, don't mistake that which is dukkha for sukkha. So did he say there's no sukkha? The Hinayana, and this is a view, by the way, from Mahayana. So take that for what it's worth. But the general idea is, is that in the Hinayana, they say impermanent is across the board, meaning samsara, nirvana, nothing's permanent, like nothing. Dukkha? All dukkha. There's no sukkha. They, they, the idea being that nirvana is not blissville. And by the way, there's, they have a very strong, in terms of non-duality and things like that, they have a very strong case for denying sukkha in nirvana. Nirvana is supposed to be totally beyond all distinctions and dualities in that way. So when they deny it in both, it makes sense. So permanence, suffering, the one about the self. They say there's no self happening here, no self in samsara, and of course, there's no Atman in nirvana. Makes, kind of makes sense. And then the, the fourth one, the idea that this samsaric realm, everything here is impure. Don't mistake this impure realm for being pure. But nirvana? No purity either, says the Hinaya. Also, again, beyond all those distinctions. So Hinayana denies all four in both samsara and nirvana. Early Mahayana. And actually, I wouldn't even say early Mahayana. I'd say like Mahayana. Basically, the idea is, is that Mahayana Buddhism in general denies those four in samsara, but asserts that they are existent in a sense in nirvana, in the sense that nirvana is permanent, nirvana is blissful. You will experience the bliss of nirvana. That's the self I'm talking about. Or that there is a self in nirvana. It's not this self, but there is a self in nirvana that experiences nirvana. And then fourth, nirvana is pure, is lovely, is attractive in that sense. What's really funny is that in something that is called the bodhisattva yana, those are called the eight inverted views. Meaning the Hinayana is wrong. And the Mahayana is wrong, <laughs> which is a very interesting position to take on this subject. So on that note about the Hinayana Mahayana distinction between these four, let's get back to our main sutra. So this is that uh, Manjushri Pure Land Sutra we've been reading. Again, if you haven't been here, we've been just going through this sutra real slowly, but the Buddha has been giving Shariputra, our good old friend Shariputra, some advice on how to be a bodhisattva. And in many ways, what I would like to say is 
this sutra is one of those pure land sutras. It's about purifying a Buddha land, right? And what I want you to kind of be thinking about is what it means to be a bodhisattva in this sense, what it means to be purifying a Buddha land, what it means to, to adorn, decorate your Buddha land with virtues. It's about getting rid of these four inversions. <laughs> like it's what I'm getting at is, is that this whole bodhisattva pure land, it's kind of just a beautiful way of talking about the practice. <laughs> and so to purify a Buddha land is to turn these things right, to turn these four things right. So how to do that though? Oh, actually, I can't do that. I can't even read this because I didn't finish our original sutra. And that's way more important because it's really, really beautiful. So I only got up to where the Buddha described what the four inversions were. I almost blew it. So there are practitioners, these four non-inversions of perception, non-inversions of mind and non-inversions of view. What are these four? The non-inversion of perception, mind, and view is the one that takes the impermanent to be impermanent. The non-inversion of perception, mind, and view is that which takes suffering to be suffering. The non-inversion of perception, mind, and view is taking that which has no self to have no self. The non-inversion of perception, mind, and view is that which takes the unattractive to be unattractive, to be unlovely in that sense. These are the four non-inversions of perception, mind, and view. And then the Buddha recited this poem. Seeing permanence in the impermanent, seeing pleasure in what is suffering, seeing self in what is non-self, and perceiving or seeing attractiveness in what is unattractive. Beings therefore resort to wrong views, their minds deranged, their perception twisted. Such people are bound by the yoke of Mara and do not reach security from bondage. Beings continue to revolve in samsara, going through birth and death and rebirth. But when the Buddhas arise in the world, sending forth a bright, brilliant light, they reveal this dharma that leads to the stilling of suffering. Having heard it, the wise regain their sanity. They see the impermanent as impermanent and what is suffering as suffering. They see what is not a self as not a self and the unattractive as unattractive. By the acquisition of right view, they overcome all suffering. Okay, so that concludes that sutra. Now, right there at the end, by the acquisition of right view, they overcome all suffering. So now what I wanna remind you of as we transition to our Mahayana Sutra, I always like to, as often as I can, I like to tie in the Heart Sutra to these talks because it's so accessible and so many people are familiar with it. So if you know about the Heart Sutra, 
you'll be familiar with a line that talks about how the bodhisattva escapes upside down dreamlike thinking and completely realizes nirvana. So that's in the Heart Sutra, and it talks specifically about overcoming these inverted thinking. So escaping upside down or inverted dreamlike thinking. That's a direct reference to this uh, viprayasha, these inversions. But what I really want you to notice is at the end of this, you know, the Heart Sutra begins the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara practicing pranyaparamita clearly sees that the skandhas are empty, thus overcoming all suffering. This poem ends by, by the acquisition of right view, the wise overcome all suffering. So what I'm getting at here is this Mahayana Sutra that we've been reading, it's really focused on wisdom, pranya, wisdom as a paramita, as a deliverance, as a means of enlightenment in that sense. And the idea here is, is that what is the difference between Hinayana and Mahayana? Well, one basic difference is the Hinayana is it's an, a path of austerity. The idea is it's a path of renunciation. It's a path of celibacy, poverty, homelessness. It's an austere path. And the idea is, is that's one way to overcome the four inversions, is to live a life that is not based upon the acquisition of pleasure from external things, that's not based upon ego and self, that's not based upon all of those inversions. And so you could live that way. And there's a sense in which if you just live that way, it will clear out the gunk, the, the poisons in that sense, the kleshas, and these four inverted views. The bodhisattva path, the Mahayana path, I often like to say, is a path of wisdom. And the idea, and it's articulated in this, which is that if you have the right view, all else sort of follows from that. Now, this is just another path, of course. I'm not saying it's a better path or whatever a path, it's just a different path. And the sutra that we're reading, this Mahayana Sutra, is very much a part of that wisdom path. In, in many ways. So how can I, okay, so I read that Pali, you know, Pali-based sutta, pretty short and pretty straightforward, right? I mean, you had to kind of know the words, but once you knew what the words meant, you know, even repeats it multiple times. So in case you didn't get it, right? So it's pretty straightforward of a teaching. As I often am mentioning, these Mahayana sutras are different. They're just different. And I'm not going to kind of try to go too in depth into this section that we're in. We're in this section where the Buddha is telling Shariputra all these different qualities that a bodhisattva has. And these qualities have been given in, well, he started with one. Then he said, well, actually, if a bodhisattva has two qualities. And then he said, well, if, bodhisattva, if bodhisattvas have three qualities. And then last week, it was four qualities. Tonight, it's five qualities. So you see there's kind of an anguttara and adding one thing going on in this sutra as well. But this sutra, though, is weird. I'm just going to say it. It's weird. <laughs> We, if you weren't here, we spent several nights where the Buddha was just sending out this light to these other like Buddha lands 
And there were these other Buddhas in these other lands that saw the light. And then they all came to this world to hear this sutra taught by the Buddha. So like we went on that kind of wild excursion and then Shariputra gets up and says, hey, how do Bodhisattvas do it? And the, Bodhisattva, and the Buddha starts going through all of these things. And at first they were kind of, I don't know, they kind of made normal sense in a way. But as this has gone along, they're getting a little weirder. And then we get to this point where he says, Shariputra, if Bodhisattvas have five qualities, they will acquire a fine array of virtues for their Buddha land and their Buddha land will become pure just as they wish. What are the five? And I'm just gonna paraphrase them for you because it's a little complicated, but the first one, it says, oh yeah, bodhisattvas have this quality that if they ever see someone teaching the Dharma, they'll ask them how bodhisattvas decorate their Buddha lands with virtues. <laughs> That's the first quality. And what has started to happen in the sutra, if you were coming in the previous nights, the sutra started referring to itself. <laughs> and it started talking about how all those bodhisattvas were coming from those other worlds to hear, to hear this teaching of the Array of Virtues Sutra. And then it starts to do this thing where a quality of the bodhisattvas that if they hear a bodhisattva teach in the Dharma, they'll ask how to decorate their Buddha lands. The second one is about how a bodhisattva can, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's about how they have this ability to will or kind of meditate themselves to another Buddha land. And those Buddhas, or sorry, those bodhisattvas that do that, they have <laughs> this ability where they can look around at that Buddha land and observe all the decorations, all the adornments of that Buddha land, and then go before the Buddha of that Buddha land and ask how bodhisattvas decorate their Buddha land with virtues. And then the third of these is about how the bodhisattva purifies their wisdom. And how do they purify their wisdom? By understanding, sorry. Basically, it says they, under, they purify their wisdom by understanding causation. And it's kind of like, okay, and then additionally, Shariputra, bodhisattvas must be skilled in the idea of pratitya samutpata, dependent origination, or cause and origination. What are cause and origination, you may ask? Cause refers to incorrect mental engagement. That is what causes beings to give rise to the four inverted views. Rather than that, bodhisattvas should put forth effort into what is correct. What is meant by correct engagement, you might ask? It is to avoid mentally engaging with any phenomena. This also applies to dependent origination. Okay, so I I'll pause there really quickly to mention, that's where it just says, that's where the four errors come from, not understanding dependent origination. Now you know what the four errors are. We'll talk another night about 
the relationship with dependent origination. Uh, let me mention one more thing. So what would it mean to then have correct view in this sense, correct engagement? Well, it says, avoid mentally engaging in any phenomena. What does it mean to not engage in any mental phenomena? The basically, and this is just gonna be very quick because I know time is short here, but the basic idea would be what, it's about mental engagement. And so if I could ever find, well, it doesn't matter because I've shown it to you so many times, but whether it's the rabbit or whether it's the duck, the engagement is the either getting excited or getting afraid. It's about the getting worked up about any phenomena. And it's such a subtle thing because we get worked up about everything. That's a basic teaching of Buddhism from a certain point of view. But the idea here is, is that that bodhisattva, the bodhisattva here, it's aware of all the things I mentioned tonight, particularly regarding perception. And so the idea is, is that the bodhisattva basically understands that perception is a grand illusion, truly dreamlike in that way. And so to chase it, to want it, to crave it, to need it, no. To be fearful of it and anxious about it, no. This is what we call equanimity. It's neither getting excited or depressed in that way. And, but we do it out of wisdom. This is the only way this kind of thing works, as far as I'm concerned, is to do that practice out of wisdom, out of knowing. And so finally, just to conclude this section, the fifth quality, Shariputra. Additionally, bodhisattvas, oh, you must know the essential nature of the Buddha and the essential nature of realms, particularly Buddha realms, but it could be any kind of realm. So once again, a bodhisattva understands, knows the essential nature of the Buddha and the essential nature of realms. What's the essential nature of the Buddha? And what's the essential nature of realms, you may ask? The essential nature of the Buddha is merely a word, as is the essential nature of all realms. What is merely a label, what is merely a word, is known via disengagement. So the less one observes, the more one knows. Shariputra, if bodhisattvas have those five qualities, their aspirations will not degenerate and they will acquire a well-adorned uh, Buddha land of multiple arrays of virtues. All right, so hopefully that last fifth quality really brought this all the way home in that sense in terms of the uh, provisional fabricated nature of reality. So, <laughs> all right, that's it for me, folks. Thank you so much for, unless there's any last qu questions, comments. Yeah, you, you, you could have jumped in earlier. But. All right, everybody, so great to see you. I'll pass it over to Noam for any burning SFDC news.